Wandering Knight, Budding Hero, written by K. Arsenault Rivera. Across the valleys and into the wilds ventures Rowan Kenrith. Atop a stout horse, with a sharp blade hanging at her hip and sparks dancing from her fingertips, she journeys wherever the winds guide her. Gladly the small folk take her into their homes, offering what little they have. Gladly does Rowan accept their kindness. In the small hours of the night, when they ask her why she is awake, she asks if they've heard where she might find a cure for the wicked slumber. Are you certain you don't long for it? asked Royce, whose fine weaves even the Fae have come to covet. Rowan has stayed in palaces well less appointed than Royce's home. The Fae bestow gifts upon creators of beauty, it seems. You look like you could use the rest. Rest isn't of any use to me, Rowan answered. Royce, eyes flashing in the dark, tutted beneath her breath. Rest will come for you, whether you like it or not. Best to face it on your own terms, she said. But if you are determined to continue in your quest, brave knight, there is a castle not far from here. Its lord died long ago, longer than your kind remember. My kind? Rowan's grip tightened on her sword. Royce only smiled. The moonlight played upon her skin, and the glamour broke, revealing eight eyes, two chittering mandibles, eight arms hidden beneath her stole. Little wondering, her weaving fascinated humans and fae alike. You're... Rowan started. Royce set her two human hands on her knees. I have promised you shelter and given you food. We are not enemies. Rowan relaxed her grip. She did not sleep that night, but she did learn a little of weaving. In the morning, Royce pointed the way to the castle, wishing Rowan good fortune on her journey. Its crumbling walls and ancient parapets now welcome her. Dust cakes her lungs the farther she goes. Undead servants rise to meet her blade. Heart hardened against such sights, she slays them, their innards slicking the stone floors. When at last she finds the library, its shelves stand empty. There are no alembics here, no cauldrons for potion crafting, no lost secrets, only whatever the looters have left behind. After all that she has done to get here, all the blood she has spilled, nothing. Alone in the abandoned castle, Rowan Kenrith becomes a storm. She imagines what her brother would say if he saw her here, and this only drives her further into a rage. By the time she realizes she has begun to weep, her body is already shaking and weary. Against all reason, there is a bed in this place, untouched by the ravages of looting. When she collapses upon it, she realizes the truth of Royce's words, rest will come, one way or another. The dream swallows her. Once more she walks through the doors of this castle, but they are whole, the wood polished and new. Within the halls are the bards and dancers, fair women and handsome men lead her further. A fit squire removes her armor so smoothly she forgets she'd ever worn it. A warm robe is draped over her shoulders, a tankard of mead placed in her hand. Pulled along by such delight, she finds herself before a feasting table. Her father and mother stand at the head, hale, hearty, faces radiant in the golden light of the castle. They spread their arms towards her. Rowan, you made it, Lyndon says. Rowan's chest goes tight. There they are, just as she remembers them. No scars save for those they earned in her youth. No bloody wounds. They're so happy. She drops the mead, running to them full tilt. Her father lifts her off her feet and spins her. Her mother smooths her hair and dabs away the tears at the corners of Rowan's eyes. You've come so far to see us, says Lyndon. We're so proud of you. Her mouth opens again and again, but she cannot speak. You've need of our counsel, don't you? Her father asks. Wordless, she nods. He takes the crown from his head and places it atop her own. Come to Castle Ardenvale. Your blood awaits you there. She wakes, alone, in the dusty castle. Sunlight filters in through the broken windows. 
She must have slept the whole night through. Alone, surrounded by death and cold, she allows herself another chance to weep. For when it is over, she will do as her father asked of her. She will go to Castle Arden Vale. Um, excuse me, sir, but have you seen any witches lately? This man, like all the others Kellen has asked before him, laughs. Oh, aye, there's one down the way, sells the best pies in Edgewall. Tell her Duncan sent you. He's kind enough to toss over a coin. Kellen tucks it away in a pouch, his shoulders slumping, his spirits bruised but not broken. This is only the first step on his journey, right? There are so many people in Edgewall. One of them's bound to know something. All he has to do is keep at it. With a grunt of effort, he adjusts the pack on his shoulders and makes his way down the long, ambling street. All his life, his mother's told him stories of places like this, of dwarves, founds, knights, and mages. They didn't feel real until now. Across the street from the pie shop, an elven woman sells enchanted wooden songbirds. Up ahead, a verdant knight speaks to a smith. There are banners and baubles everywhere the eye can land. He nods to himself as he walks, decided. There's no better place to live than here. Already he can see the line of the shop doubled and tripled up. They really must make great pies. There's no way she's a real witch. His mother always told him that cooking is the closest most people can get, though. So maybe the woman who runs it will know something. Kellen plants himself at the end of the line. As he waits, his eyes wander over the messengers running from one end to the other, the bard playing his lute. He hums along. A group of children in leaf rock clothes toss pine cones back and forth in a fit of laughter and giggles. Kellen grins, watching them. But then he sees the sleeping man standing under the eaves of a shop, a swirl of violet around him. His eyes are closed, his mouth open. As he sways, drool falls on his armor. This must be the slumber the merchant told them about on his last visit. Seeing it in person is a strange thing. How long's he's been like that? There's a touch of rust where his spit hits his armor. Why does not anyone help him? Worse, someone in a hurry bumps into the sleeper. The sleeper jerks, falls over, and no one helps him up. Kellen can't let that stand. He takes a step toward the fallen knight. A hand on his wrist snaps him from his thoughts. He looks up to its owner and finds a girl in a red cloak, her brows furrowed. You might not want to do that. Kellen draws his hand back. Why not? He needs help. The girl winces. You're the kid who keeps asking people about witches? Kellen puts on a hero's voice, or tries to, but the crack undoes him. I might be. Depends on who's doing the, uh, asking. The girl laughs and shakes her head. She takes his hand again and starts tugging him along. All right, hero. You're coming with me. What? What about- Hey! What about the man? Kellen asks. The wicked slumber spreads, though no one's really sure how, she answers. If you touch him, it might get you too. That's if the witches don't get you first. Kellen looks over his shoulder at the sleeper. As the girl tugs him into an alley, someone slips a wooden baking spatula under the man. With a little effort, he is upright once more. Whatever relief Kellen feels is mitigated by his surprise once he realizes what the girls just said. Wait, they're after me? The girl looks both ways down the alley before speaking. They're going to be, if you keep asking questions like that. Don't you know you shouldn't draw a witch's attention? Do you know a lot about witches? He asks. If you do, I could really use your help. I, I just got here, so I don't know a lot, but I've got a quest to finish. A quest? She says, giving him a quick assessment. You've got a quest. You don't even have a sword. Heroes don't need swords, he says. He leaves out that the only sword his stepfather owned was rusty, so he couldn't bring it. Besides, I got these from my lord, and they said they're just as good as any blade. These mean I'm a real hero. He brandishes the pair of basket hilts, Talion's parting gift. Old wood has grown to mimic the work steel of human smithing with a peculiar glow proclaiming their unearthly provenance. They're sure to impress anyone. 
But the girl isn't just anyone, and she regards them with only a raised brow. Whenever someone insists that something's real, it means it isn't. She sighs. Anyway, I wouldn't be of much help. You've got to go out to Dunborough. My brother, Peter, he knows every inch of that place like the back of his hand. He could help you. Helen stows his hilts with a bashful sort of gratitude. Could you take me to him? The girl's expression clouds under the brim of her cloak. I haven't seen him in days. I thought maybe you'd seen him since you're from out of town. Oh, says softly. I'm sorry, I didn't know. I, um, I don't think I met any Peters along the way here. Figures, said the girl. She turns. Well, I wish you all the best on your quest, hero. If you see my brother, tell him Ruby's waiting for him back home. Kellen, shorter than her by half a head, shuffles after her. Wait! You can tell him yourself if you come with me. She stops. When she turns this time, her brow is raised. You're going to find him? I might, says Kellen. You said Dunborough is where all the witches are. You've been there, haven't you? Ruby dusts off her shoulder. Once or twice? I bet it's more than that, Kellen says. If you can help me find the witch I'm looking for, then maybe my liege can help you find your brother. Ruby tilts her head. And just who is your liege, anyway? Oh no, he can't say it's the Lord of the Fae. That's no way to earn anyone's trust. But he can't lie, either. Kellen's cheeks go hot. They don't like people talking about them very much, he says. It's true enough, right? But they're helping me find my father. That's what I get for finishing the quest, a chance to know who he is. So I'm sure they'll help you with your brother. A pause. Ruby's studying him. He tries to stand tall. You're sure your liege can help? Kellen nods. Sure as sheep's wool. Ruby frowns for a second, then nods, the tension leaving her shoulders. All right. I guess someone's got to look out for you, and it might as well be me. Over the heaths and through the burrow, in search of witches, they go. From the stories his mother told him, Kellen expected the wilds to be prettier than this. Maybe it's the aftermath of the war. Ruby tells him that the sharp metallic aberrations dotting the countryside are Phyrexian remnants, hacked apart after the slumbers stopped them in their tracks. Those things used to be alive? He asked her. If you can call it alive, she answers, you really don't know? Stopping by one of them, what looks to be some kind of walking battering ram, she shows him the oil oozing from within it, the face of its two weeping eyes. Kellen turns away, preferring the twisted trees of Dunborough to the twisted body of the invader. Where'd they come from? Somewhere else, says the boy king, Ruby explains, some other realm. There are other realms? As they walk together through the woods, he does his best to keep the ignoble corpse behind him focusing instead on the flitting shapes of pixies, the black streaks of birds overhead, on darting stoats. What are they like? I don't know, Ruby answers. If they have those things in them, though, I'm fine without visiting the place. Besides, I'd never go anywhere without my brother. Kellen nods. I'd never go anywhere without my family, either. Anywhere, you know. Else. Ruby quirks a brow at him. Even if it was for your quest? He lets that one lie, unwilling to even consider it. Ruby clears a fallen bow with surprising ease, then helps Kellen to do the same. When his feet hit the earth, water splashes onto her shoes. She yelps. Somewhere in the woods around them, a pixie laughs. Since time immemorial, it has been impolite to laugh at a struggling girl. It is the purview of a hero to defend such damsels. Helen frowns and prepares to shout the impish thing away, until Ruby picks up an apple from her basket and flings it hard as a giant flinging a boulder, as fast as a crossbow bolt. The pixie yelps in misery. Ruby pouts. They're so annoying, she says, continuing along the unmarked path, as if she hadn't displayed such talents. Kellen, awestruck, can only follow. King's wounds, what a shot! She stops just to stare at him for saying such a thing. King's wounds, really? She says. It's just an apple. I'm sure you can do a lot more with those fancy swords your liege has given you. 
It takes concerted effort not to trip when she says this, though there are no brambles in sight. He tries to think of something to say, or what the best way to tell her he has no idea how to turn the hilts into anything useful might be. But the words are as tricksy as the pixie Ruby so easily dispatched. All he manages is an unsure, hmm. But it makes little difference, for at that moment an arrow whistles past his face, nicking the tip of his nose before striking the tree nearest him. Kellen covers his face in alarm. Are those war drums he's hearing, or his own frantic pulse? Though fear has gotten the better of him, Ruby is quick to act as ever. She tackles Kellen into a blackberry bush. His mother's weaving keeps him safe from the thorns thirsty for blood, and the leaves keep him safe from their assailant. King's wounds, what is that? Ruby whispers. Beyond the border of the thicket, they can see him, the man in wolf armor. Beneath the mail, a blood-red gambeson seems an omen of wounds to come. The bow that had shot the near-fatal arrow is as wicked as the thorns of the bush. At his hip hangs a sword as long as Kellen's legs. The snarling metal maw of a wolf conceals all but his burning eyes. And he is staring right at them. Kellen's throat is tight. He saw a knight for the first time only hours ago. What is this thing? The wolf knight strides towards them. Run! Kellen shouts. Ruby doesn't need to be told twice. Throwing themselves from the bush, they scrabble to their feet and dash ahead. A wordless howl from the wolf knight peals through the forest. Crows flee from their nests in terror. Even the pixies who tormented them earlier have cleared away. Another arrow whistles over Kellen's shoulder. Now would be a great time for those magic swords, Ruby shouts. We can't keep running forever. Kellen swallows. Pressure mounts within his chest. He can't lie to her, but the hilts aren't swords either. They're just hilts. Talion said they'd help refine his abilities. Of course, in all the time he's traveled with them, he hasn't been able to do anything except punch things a little harder or... Well, well it's better than nothing. Turning toward the wolf knight, Kellen hurls one of the hilts as hard as he can. It bounces uselessly off his armor, then flies back to Kellen's hand. Oops, he says. What was... All right, all right, okay. I've got this. Follow me, Ruby calls. Her groan hurts, but he can't blame her. It would be great if he did know how to use them. He could probably slice clean through an oak tree with a fey wrought blade, but as it stands, he's kind of a joke. I'm sorry, I'm still learning. Wait, what are those? As they run beneath the massive body of a dead invader, they come upon half a dozen creatures. If a toddler's malformed drawing of a wolf were given form, muscle, and fang, it might resemble one of these beings. Their forelegs and haunches are dense with power, their muzzles slick with blood. Witch stalkers, Ruby answers. You're not magical, right? Kellen winces. Uh, I, uh, I, I'm not sure. Well, it's time to find out, Ruby says. He expects her to stop, or hide, or lead the witch stalkers back toward the wolf knight. But Ruby does no such thing. She runs towards the pack of witch stalkers, weaving between them, her cloak dragging past their faces. By the time she's cleared them, she's wearing a giddy smile beneath the hood. Easy enough for her to do. There's a pit in Kellen's stomach. As he looks at the witch stalkers, his lord's gifts or his father's blood might doom him should he risk it. But he has his mother's love to keep him safe, a thick cloak that's fought off plenty so far. He throws up his own hood. If Ruby can do it, Kellen can too. Hard as he can, he runs between the gathered witch stalkers. He's halfway through before he realizes the high-pitched yelling he hears is coming from his own mouth, a sound between the wail of a ghost and the laugh of a child at play. Every beat of his heart feels stolen and glorious, though he doesn't linger to see if the creatures will attack him. When he clears the pack, he still finds himself doubling over with relief. They didn't bite him. Not even a nibble. He laughs in earnest. He did it. He really did it. His first brush with adventure. Ruby offers Kellen a hand and he takes it, looking back the way they came. The wolf knights stepped into the clearing. Come on, come on, whispers Ruby. He's got to be magical. Two youths, hoarding their breath like a dragon hoard gems, stare down the wolf knight. The pursuer, in turn, lets out another wordless howl. The witch stalkers answer. 
As one, their heads perk and they turn toward the wolf knight, their growls resonating in Kellen's chest. The wolf knight runs into the woods as his witch stalkers give chase. I think we're safe, he says, huffing. He grins. You did it, Ruby. She stares at the witch stalkers as they take off. It looks like she can't believe she's still standing. Yeah, I guess I did, she says. Relieved, Kellen turns and notices the cabin for the first time. He's not sure how neither of them saw it before now. Maybe this is what his mother meant whenever she talked about the chaos of a melee. When you're busy trying to make sure you get out of something alive, you aren't always paying attention to the horizon. Still, it's hard to miss. The house is thorny and black, as if made from blackberry brambles, standing twice as tall as those back home. Violet windows pulse with light from within. All around the house, there is a thicket of violet mist. Ruby, Kellen says, taking her hand to get her attention. Look, that's the witch's house. It's got to be. It takes her only a glance to agree with him. I'll be damned, you're right, she says. What should we do? Those windows are huge. We can try and peek inside, then figure out how we're going to defeat her, Kellen says. He hopes Ruby won't ask for more details than that. Luckily, she doesn't. The two of them slink through the twisting trees and thick bushes towards the house. Burrs cling to Kellen's cloak. He thinks of each one as a well-wish from his father. He's so close to finishing this first witch off. Will Talion give him a hint? Maybe a riddle? The thought of discovering more is as tempting as fresh fruit on a hot summer day. The brush allows them to get right up underneath the lowest of the witch's windows. Here at the bottom, the glass is thick, distorting the two figures in the cabin. One, Kellen thinks, is the witch. She walks in a broad circle around a large darkness in the center of the room. Smoke rises from whatever she is guarding. The other figure is slumped over, their back to the window. A real cauldron, Kellen mumbles. I wonder what she's using it for. Eating people, answers Ruby readily. I've heard a couple of rumors that there was someone nearby boiling people's bones into stew. And that's definitely a cauldron. And she's definitely got someone tied up. Witches don't eat people, Kellen says. My mom was almost a witch, and she'd never do anything like that. Have you considered that maybe that's why she's almost a witch, not is a witch? Ruby asks. She tugs on his cloak. Get down. I think she's coming. She is. The witch's pacing around her bubbling cauldron brings her toward them now. Kellen and Ruby duck beneath the windowsill in time to avoid her gaze, but only just. Even through the glass, her eyes are wicked and piercing, a violet not unlike the glow surrounding them. So what's the plan? Ruby asks. Kellen puts a hand to his chin as he's considering one. The deception, such as it is, lasts a second at most. Then he shrugs. We're going to play it by ear. What? Ruby hisses, eyes narrowing. You can't be serious. That's a real live witch in there. We aren't going to be able to win with magic, and we don't have any weapons, Kellen says. He slinks around the corner of the cabin, careful to keep from touching the cursed plumes of smoke along the ground. And I've got this new friend who taught me the value of improvising. Improvising's one thing, but this is asking for trouble, Ruby says, following him anyway. Kellen waves at her to stay put. He points to his eyes, then to the window. Let me know when she's facing away from the door, he says. Ruby frowns, but stays put beneath the window. Meanwhile, Kellen leans an ear against the door. From within, he hears a keening song. Delivered without much care for rhythm or melody, the singer is nonetheless enthralled with the sound of her own voice. When I was hungry and night wandered in, wild at heart and covered in tin. A night? She's going to eat a knight? How easy it was to beat her in truth, but how hard to eat her without breaking a tooth. Sweat rolls down Kellen's brow. Ruby was right. This isn't any normal witch. She's nothing like his mother. If they don't act fast, that knight's probably going to die. But what to do? He doesn't have much time to think. From around the corner, he sees a blur of red, another apple thrown by his new friend. A fine signal, he thinks until he hears the apple thunk against the metal. A glance over his shoulder is all he can afford, but he already knows what he's going to see, the Wolf Knight. Had he already fought off the Witch Stalkers? Yes, that's his shape slinking through the mists, covered in blood. 
He can't leave Ruby outside with him, and he can't let that witch eat that knight. If he saves the knight inside, maybe she can fight off the one outside. Maybe when the witch is gone, the wolf knight will just fade away. That's what happened to conjured guardians in stories, anyway. Kellen plucks a burr from his cloak. Dad, if you're listening, he says, please make me brave enough to do this. He doesn't wait for an answer because he knows he can't. He just has to have faith that it worked. Kellen opens the door quiet and quick. As a mouse slinking through a cat's domain, he scurries over to the center of the room, where the witch continues her awful song. Lashed to a rod near the bubbling cauldron is a rugged woman clad in armor, her right arm made from solid wood. Bleary and delirious, she locks eyes with him. Kellen can see the hope in her when she does that. Oh, brave knight, what shall I do? Boil and bubble, broth and brew. Oh, brave knight, I'll make you a stew. The witch is so preoccupied with stirring her foul-smelling brew that she has not yet noticed him. She stands before the cauldron, leveling a crooked finger at the knight. For once, she drops the sing-song. But what spice to use? Hmm? I don't suppose you know what you taste best with, do you? Die in a fire, the knight spits. She glances at Kellen, then gives him a covert nod. The witch, however, turns back towards the cauldron. She shakes her head, then reaches into her pocket. That isn't very kind. I need this fire cooking for you. There's an art to this, you know. I can't just throw anything in here and hope it'll end up gourmet. Whatever's in that bag she dumps in makes Kellen want to vomit, but he keeps it together. He has a job to do, and he has an opening here. Like the rams on his farm, he lowers his head and charges. You're the one that's cooked, Kellen answers. He hears the witch howl when he slams into her, and he hears her scream as she falls into the cauldron, but he tries not to think about the implications of any of it. A puff of black smoke rises, the smell so acrid it brings tears to his eyes. Kellen runs towards the night. There will be time to think about what he's done later. Right now, he needs to make sure Ruby's safe, and the best way to do that is free this woman. Can you fight? He asks, hands working the knots around her wrists. One of her arms, he notices, is made of a strange, pliable wood that struggles just like flesh and muscle. Gah! If you get me my hammer. It isn't an answer that fills him with confidence, but it's what he's got. The ropes fall away. He scans the chaotic mess of the cabin in search of a warhammer. There. It's slumped against a counter covered in all manner of viscera and gore, with jars labeled Eye of Newt and Toe of Frog. As he runs for the hammer, Ruby dashes in through the door. He's almost here. The knight's going to save us, Kellen says. He can't lift the hammer, but he can drag it over. She can still fight. He hands the hammer to the knight, who stands. Or tries to. But Kellen learns here an important lesson. Not all knights can be heroes all the time. This one is far too exhausted, far too beaten. She collapses back into her ignoble seat. Kellen's heart is somewhere in his throat when the wolf knight walks through the door, covered in blood, his sword freshly used. Had they come all this way only to... Get up, Kellen says, shoving the knight. You can do this, come on. You used to defend the realm. That was a long time ago, the knight mumbles. Yet once more she tries to stand, and once more she falls. The wolf knight stops at the threshold. Ruby hurls a jar of something foul. Clay shatters against his armor. He turns towards her. Ruby, bellows the wolf knight. I finally found you. Ruby's eyes go wide. She stands from her hiding spot, lowers her hood. The wolf knight doffs his helm. Beneath is the face of a grizzled woodsman, his beard thick and his hair unkempt. Yet his eyes are kind and his smile warm. He spreads his arms. Ruby, it's me. Peter, Ruby shouts. She runs to him, and he is there to meet her, lifting her up and spinning her around before he sets her down on her feet. What happened? Are you all right? I don't know. I've never seen this place before today. I went out hunting and there was this awful song, he says. This is a witch's cabin, isn't it? She must have enchanted me. I'm so sorry I scared you, but I'm happy you're safe. Ruby throws her arms around him. Don't worry, she says. I'll forgive you for that, if you forgive me for sicking the witch stalkers on you. He tousles her hair. I'd expect no less from you. You were always the clever one in the family, he says. And 
He turns toward Kellen in the night. You there, boy. You helped my sister, didn't you? Whatever you ask of me, only speak and I will grant it, if it's in my power to do so. She did most of the work, he says. But if you want to help, I have to get the cauldron to my leech. They said I needed to show them I'd... Say no more. You need someone to carry it, and I shall, Peter says. His eyes fall on the injured knight, and he winces. I must have caused you great harm. My apologies. The knight groans. It wasn't a fair fight between you and that crone. Stay here. Once we've moved the cauldron to its destination, Ruby and I can make you a healing salve. There are plenty of ingredients here, and I think I remember something of herb lore. If the knight has any counter-argument, her mind is too addled with pain to make it. Peter enlists Ruby and Kellen's help with the cauldron. The two of them together hold up one side, while he lifts the other, bearing the majority of the weight. Kellen tries not to think about what's sloshing around inside. Together, they're able to move it through the threshold. But instead of the violet mists, Talion's court greets them on the other side. This time, the kindly lord does not make themselves visible. Kellen knows they are present only when familiar music plays around them. There are no pleasantries this time. Their advice is quick and to the point. Hilda is the next witch you seek. Her magic is great, her skill yet greater. She has concealed herself from my eyes. But consult the mirror Indrulan, and you may yet find her. Torn from Castle Vantris, by Gera Grand Squall. It now lies far from its home. Worry not, my wisdom will save you the troubling of hunting it down. A beanstalk grows not a half day's ride from here. Climb it, and you shall find the mirror at its peak. No sooner have they finished speaking than the court disappears, forgotten as a dream. The trio stands once more before the cabin. Ruby staring at him. Your liege is the Fey King, she says. Is that... does that upset you? Kellen says. I was going to ask if you wanted to come. I could really use your help, both of you. I'd be of no help to you, wounded as I am, Peter says. I'll not be in fighting shape for days yet. Ruby looks from Kellen to Peter and back again. She sighs. You help me find my brother, so I'll help. But let's rest for a while. We can tend to the knight's wounds and figure out what it is we're going to do. Kellen's fingers are shaking. But do you hate that I'm working with the Fae? He's surprised how much Ruby's scoff sets him at ease. Are you kidding? That just means you're braver than I thought. And that? That he can live with.